guys, welcome back to Ginger's Burn and episode two of String Theory, the live YouTube show where you ask the questions and we give the answers for all things string. Welcome back. We're really glad to have you. There's been a lot of talk about this. We had a good time here last week. Uh, the first episode, we had about 50 people in asking questions and having a lot of fun with us. We gave a $500 gift certificate away last week on a J.P. Cormier model Boucher guitar. This week, we're giving away a $200 gift certificate for any Boucher or Lakewood guitar sold at G&G Music in Antigonish by one of our main sponsors, our main partner. And uh, also want to give a big shout out to Robin Boucher and all the guys at Boucher Guitars, Julian, Guillaume, all the crew, and last but not least, a very exciting addition to our family here on String Theory is Levy Straps has signed on board with us uh, to help us out with some promotional materials and stuff. So you're going to be able to get your hands on some cool Levy ge Levy's gear as time goes on. And uh, yeah, so this is we're having a lot of fun. This is this is this is the most exciting thing I think I've done in a long time being able to do this with you guys. And uh, the uh, we're a it's a we're a free will donation situation here, so if if you if you like what you see and you learn something, you get a piece of information you want, and you feel like sending us a couple bucks, well, go ahead and do that. You can do it by going to PayPal.me/slash JP Cormier Music, or by email transfer to JP Cormier thirty eight at Gmail dot com. And uh, yeah, we appreciate it. Everybody's been real good to us and supporting us the whole. This whole pandemic, such an odd time, but I think we're all doing okay, and the latest reports have been good here in the province of Nova Scotia. So we're pretty we're pretty happy happy to be here, doing this and being able to to reach out to you guys online this way, both on YouTube here and Facebook, and uh, yeah, there's live concerts happening. If, and one last thing I'll, I'll forget to, to mention if I don't is subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Please hit the subscribe button on my channel. If you're watching a video of me on here and you enjoy it, hit that button. It tells YouTube that I've got one more, uh, you know, repeat customer coming to see my stuff on the channel. And it helps us a great deal. You have no idea what it will do for us if we can get... Uh, 10,000 subscribers. We're, we're well out. Our last drive we did get us up over well over 6,000. So we want to get to 10 because a whole bunch of new tools become available to us and we're going to use those tools to entertain you and ourselves. So that's a part of the part of the ploy here. You guys have a good time, but we have a good time too. So anyhow, I'm going to start the show as I, as I want to start each week uh, with a question that was, was missed last week. Uh, there's a few of them here, but I want to start with one that uh, I noticed. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're going to, I think I'll go with Daryl Poirier. He had a, asked a kind of a cool question. Um, you'll, you'll notice from watching, watching this show or watching me anywhere online that I use a, I use a large number of guitars. Now the 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 bulk of my of my of my stable of instruments are bouchers. I have eight of them, and so and they're all different body styles and different everything. They're they're literally they cover every base you can imagine when it comes to either recording or performing. So <clears throat> the question was, do how do I choose a guitar for, or do I choose a guitar at all? for different projects and different applications and the answer is absolutely yes uh to give you an example if i was going to record something and i wanted to uh have a, you have a, obviously have a rhythm guitar on this recording and i needed you know kind of a big fat rhythm that could fill a lot of space in the sonic image i would use one of my Boucher guitars, probably the jumbo, the biggest body, right, which would give me the darkest, fattest tone. If I was playing intricate lead parts, I would use one of the smaller body Boucher's, or I would use one of my one of my Yamaha A series, which have which have a very penetrative, uh, 
midi kind of mid tone without being harsh and uh, and on and on it goes like you it depends on what the application is what the song is what the tempo is uh how many other instruments are on the recording and uh, when it comes to live work it's it's just i like to i like to try to cycle through all of my instruments so they all get played you know fairly equally although i must admit that over the last couple of years there's been there's been two bouchers that have really got abused and that's the, that's the yogi which is my this is a triple lot and of course my signature model which has went on the road with me for months when i got it and i didn't want to turn it loose and uh, it also is a triple lot body so for live it doesn't really matter because as long as it's a good guitar and it has a k and k pickup in it uh you're going to have a good live sound basically pretty well with anything if you have it EQ'd properly. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's sort of how that works. So uh, let's let's go to the phones, as they say, and see uh, what who's over there doing things and what. First question's from Kelly Donovan. Kelly Donovan, how are you doing? Uh, she says, I played the fiddle by ear. Am I losing something by not being able to read music? You absolutely are not. Uh, reading music, it, and I hate to say this, there'd be a ton of people out there will disagree with me, but I think that reading music is actually actually a detriment to learning. It's, it's, there's, there's something that happens, especially with fiddlers, that uh, doesn't really happen with any other instrument. Because the violin has no frets, it, it's, it makes it a thousand times harder to play because you have to use your ear. There is no written... Uh, algorithm of any kind that can teach you how to hear so you have to use your ears to play the fiddle you have to be able to tell when you're in tune and if necessary put tape across your fretboard so you know where the notes are until your hand your left hand achieves muscle memory and you can play the notes in tune without even thinking about it so nowhere in what i just described is reading a tune off a piece of paper going to help you but with that being said, once you can play, being able to read simple music like reels and jigs and such is incredibly useful for learning new material quickly. But I would still stress to you, as a fiddler especially, that you learn everything by ear. It's so important because not only does uh, learning by ear force you to use your own ears to hear your intonation. It also forces you to be able to listen to another fiddler and tell what he's doing without seeing him. And that's so important. There's just no way around it. You have to be able to... And, and fiddlers, if, they're, if they end up being good fiddlers, are slightly more gifted at being able to hear what's happening in another room than somebody who can look at paper and has frets and like there's there's that's a little easier because the notes are under the right by the frets but if you're a fiddler and your ear is trying to tune your own instrument while you're trying to figure out what someone else is playing and you can pull that off that's another level of of ear muscle memory right so i uh, the answer the short answer is leave theory beyond basic theory you need to know your scales and what they are and how they work but sight reading and those type of things and learning tunes exclusively from paper is something you should leave until you have a repertoire of tunes you can play by ear. So you have something to go by. Because once, if you're learning two things at once as well, if you're learning the mechanics of the instrument and how to read a compli very complicated notation uh, s s set, it's a, it makes life way more difficult. So learn one thing at a time. And the easiest thing to learn and the best thing to learn for your your ongoing path as a fiddler is, is to go by ear. And then later on, go to theory so that you can learn stuff more quickly and probably retain it better because you can then have a, you have a visual cue in your head as well from imagining the sheet music after you've read it. So that's, that's that. So who's next? Doug Law. Doug Law? Mm-hmm. Doug Law. Uh, he says, I know when you finger pick, you use a thumb pick. 
but what about your fingers? Do you use metal, plastic, your fingernails? I've never used any picks on my fingers for the simple reason that I, at the time when I learned to play guitar, I, I didn't know they existed. And, and frankly, I don't think I ever would have gravitated toward them because I never saw Chet Atkins use them. Uh, Chet used a combination of nail and flesh, as, does guitar, as do guitar players or did, like Jerry Reed. And also uh, Tommy Emanuel uses just flesh and a little bit of nail. And that's what I use. And it's uh, the ends of your fingers, especially these two fingers, can become just as calloused in a, in a strange sort of way as these do. But it's a different kind of callus. But it makes the, the the flesh is thicker there on these fingers than normal people's flesh. So it it gives you a, it gives you a a variety of tone, and also a physical connection with the strings. Which if you've got a pick in the way, uh, that's a serious problem for creating muscle memory. And which is weird because. Banjo players have to have to wear metal picks on their fingers to play a five-string banjo to get the tone that Scruggs used or had. And so that that's a world unto itself when you're dealing with a banjo and you have to wear those three picks. Uh, you're utilizing a different muscle memory because you can't feel the strings. On guitar, it's always a great idea to keep connected to the instrument physically as much as you possibly can. The, the more... Literally, the more flesh you have contact in the instrument, the better you off you are, because you know where you are, and you and you find strings easier, and string position, and spacing, and depth, and all these things that you wouldn't find out if you had a bunch of plastic or metal in between your hands and the instrument. So uh, yeah, so who's next? We got lots. Um, of these. these are good questions. This is actually a question we asked last week as well that we didn't make it to. Uh, oh, it's yeah. Michael Easter. Hi, Michael Easter. Yes, I remember your name from last week. Uh, do you hear keys as being darker or brighter, like G major versus E major? If so, does it impact which key a new song will use? Oh, absolutely. Like, uh, it, absolutely. I was, I was talking to uh, our producer about this today. Like, if you take, you know, a song like The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which is actually in a, a suspended kind of A chord, the melody that Lightfoot wrote against that almost sounds minor. It almost sounds like it could be a legend in the song that you born down in But it was actually he's actually playing a major. But he's just not using the C sharp. So it that that's a color, right? It's a dark song, so my brain wants to hear it be major. Or minor, I should say. So yeah, absolutely. If you if you're writing a happy song, you're probably not going to do it in a minor key. It just is very odd that, that ha it has happened, it does happen. But uh, it normally, like, you, if you're writing a, a, a bright, a happy piece of music, you're going to do it in a major key. And you're going to use minor keys as the turns in the melody that, are, that make it pretty. They don't make it dark. But if you're starting off something in a minor key, most chances are your the 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 mood of the song is darker, and opens the door to, you know, a lot of things. It, the whatever mood you start out with writing a song, is going to infl influence your lyric, you know, the melody, the courses, the bridges. If you start in a major minor chord, you might want to start have a bridge in a major chord. Or like any all kinds of weird things like that. So yeah, they're mirror images of each other. They're the 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 choice between minor and major when writing or anything like that is always uh, always has an effect on the overall presentation of the song at the end of the day when you're done writing it or arranging something or whatever. Uh, so yeah, is I definitely there's definitely that in. Everything I do, I've the songs that I've written in, in minor keys are always pretty dark stories, like the Fisherman's Daughter. And uh, actually, I really haven't written that many songs in minor keys. Uh, Gone was in minor key, uh, and st st things like that. So I used to, when I was a kid, used to gravitate a lot to minor keys because they were some of the tunes that I loved to play, like Windy and Warm. And take five, and 
Uh, there was a whole slew of them when I was a kid. They were all in minor keys, and I thought minor keys were prettier. They were just they just had that beautiful melancholy thing, and I all, and I gravitated towards classical music that was also in minor keys. But after a while, I I kind of grew out of that and started to gravitate the other way. And uh, yeah, so it's I think it's, I think it, which means I think I, I've I evolved, and I think we all do. I think we we go through periods where we gravitate to one mood or another depending on our you know wherever we are in our life and the timeline and what's going on in our lives at the time if you're a writer you write about what you're sitting in basically at least i always have uh, you can obviously decide to write to, about things outside your sphere that you don't know and have to research but some I, I, sometimes i don't think that's as authentic as uh, writing about something you really feel inside so another reason why the, 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 the chord color is so tied to the emotion of the writer and the player, right? All right. That was a good question. Who's, who's next? Uh, Cam McMaster. Cam, how you doing? Uh, have you ever lost your desire or motivation to play and write? If so, how did you cure it? Uh, every five minutes. Matter of fact, I quit. Oh, sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I lose my motivation every day. Oh, it, it, there's, if, you, if you're not losing your motivation, you're not doing something right. Because that's the whole point of playing, is, is to... When you play music and write music, you're addicted to it. So, I guess, like, you have a, you, you can have a love-hate relationship with, a, with an addiction, Right? The addict part of, part of you wants you to remain addicted. And the other part of you goes, you can't live your life without this stuff. Right? So it's, it's, it's just like that for musicians. It's, I love music so much I can't imagine my life without it. But there's times when I have felt that I, 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 was, I had said everything I could say. That there's nothing more for me to do. I've already done everything I wanted to do. I played the hardest things I could play, you know, recorded them. I've toured, I've done, like I wrote some pretty good songs along the way over the years, over, it was over 30 years. I didn't write that many songs. And I don't know, it just, and then you just, and you sit back and go, maybe I should try to do something else, right? But all, it always comes, you can't stop yourself. And the motivation becomes, you, you start, you, self-doubt creeps in and you go, did I really try as hard as I could have? Or what happens to me all the time is I hear someone else play and they do something incredible and I go, damn, I wish I'd have thought of that. Well, the only way I could think of something like that is if I learn what he just did and then that puts that in my toolbox so I have one more thing to draw from to come up with something brilliant. And that's how it works. I Like I've heard players all my life that I, I, I heard a particular performance and just went, first I was depressed, wanted to burn my guitar, and then the next thing you know, I couldn't stop practicing. Because it was like, if he can do it, I can do it. And that's true. And it's true for everybody. It isn't just for me. If someone else can do something, you can do it. It just, you have to practice. There's no magic pill to become a great anything. It takes and there's no such thing as there's no such thing as natural talent in my opinion you might be predisposed genetically biologically a certain way to process information on a certain subject but that's about where it ends you can have a talent but what if you don't you know nurture that talent it it amounts to nothing so it's all practice. It, whatever you have, whatever gift you have, if, if you're and you want to play, it doesn't matter what, how small it is or how, if it's in the for the wrong thing or maybe you're maybe you have a great right hand and a sucky left hand, or vice versa. You just got to practice. Anything that you can see, that you see done, can be done. It just it has to, you have to learn two things. How to teach yourself. And, and what that way is. Everybody learns a different way. And the second thing 
is you, you've got to set time aside in your life to practice. It doesn't matter how you do it. I, it, through my lifetime, I've practiced in the strangest places you could ever imagine. I've, I've sat in the backseat of cars and played guitar. I've in fiddles and mandolins. And I've sat at, in, on couches watching TV and played just on the commercial breaks. And I've, you would, it's just amazing how, how, if you really want it, how easily you can find the little bits of time to just work on it. So th and that's, that's, that's the key. So that's what keeps you motivated. You, and you're going to lose motivation. Every, if you're not losing motivation throughout the process, you're not doing something right. You have to hit brick walls in order to know your failures so you don't repeat them. And uh, it's, it's just that simple. you got to practice. you got to accept failure and rejection and all those other things that go along with music. And to help with it. Push on. Push through that. Learn from what you, the mistake you made. And don't do it again. Don't make bad practice ha practice habits. Don't let bad habits turn, in, turn into everyday playing habits. Don't let a bad habit turn into a technique. Because it'll only harm you. Find the best way to do something and ask somebody. Come on here. Ask me. Join the school. Go take a lesson a workshop. Go ask a guy that, that you think plays better than you. He might not play better than you. You just don't. You just think he does. But I've told people all my life, you can learn something from the most novel, novice player in the room. And that's another, another thing to keep you motivated. When that happens to you, and you're in a room, and you know you're better than maybe half the room, and you see a guy in the corner, and he just started two weeks ago, and he plays a lick you never heard before, that's motivation because you look at him and go, man, he just started. I've been playing for five years and whatever. And you look at that guy and he just taught you something. He's only held a guitar for a month. There's your motivation. And that's, that's what it comes down to. You have to, you have to just keep practicing and you, you'll, you'll never lose. You'll never lose the drive to play. I never have. And I've been playing for 46 years. So it never left me. I never wanted to quit doing this for a living. I well, actually, I have, but again, that was my loss of motivation. And I started to try to walk away from things. I was like, "Meh, that ain't gonna work." So here I am, still here, getting gray, purple, blue, whatever. Wait till you see me this weekend. <laughs> <coughs> Who's next there, Ginger? Um, Michael O'Coin. Michael O'Coin. Oh, I have you written down. No, I didn't. But I know you. I recognize your name in some way. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he wants to know if you have any favorite locations for shows, big or small. Uh, I don't know. I don't really care. <laughs> I, I don't. It doesn't matter to me. I, I used to, I mean, I used to when, uh, when I was a little kid. I, I wanted to go to Carnegie Hall. And I never got there. So, because I didn't practice enough. <laughs> so... Yeah, I don't. I don't have a preference. Anywhere where there's people and uh, they're not on fire, or I'm not on fire. There's beer, uh, dogs. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> What's next? Uh, second to fifty. What is it? The username is second to fifty. Se second to fifty. Sounds like a younger sibling. Oh, okay. Uh, Code names now. <laughs> Do you use the same instrument when you're recording a tune in the studio as you would if you're playing the same tune live? No, I don't, and and, and it's not a ch it's not a choice. It does, it's because I because I literally cycle. I have my guitars literally on a calendar, and and also a randomizer, so I know how many times each guitar has gone out per year on the road, which is the most important thing because they, they need to be out on the road to be hit with all the environmental challenges like humidity, heat, cold, uh, quick changes from heat to cold, warm to dry, wet to dry, whatever, right? So I make a record and I use the guitar that's out in the room that I want the tone, that tone. And when I go on the road, I take the guitar that I want to play on that tour that hasn't been out recently, sometimes. 
like I say, I'm, <laughs> I'm guilty of, uh, I'm guilty these days of neglecting my non-Boucher guitars. <laughs> so, yeah. So you won't see as many Yamahas or, or Alvarez or Eastman or some of the, some of the bargain, the bargain brands I like to play because they're great guitars and people are looking for guitars under a thousand dollars that they can buy because they're saving up for a Boucher or a Martin or a Gibson or a Gallagher or whatever they're going to buy. Right. But, uh, no, I, I take the guitar that's sort of, in the in the in the queue to be taken out on the road and in the studio here i'm much more picky about the exact guitar i want for a specific tone and purpose and my microphones here are very forgiving so i don't necessarily have to struggle too hard and, and all my guitars are cannons so i i I don't have to struggle hard to find the one I want. Maybe it's just a certain color, which would, I would choose a guitar that has a different wood in it. And uh, other than that, live, I take out what needs to be taken out and given some love. And that's, that's that. This is awesome. These are good questions. What's next? Uh, we got uh, Dak Raxel again. He hey! Last week. Our winner. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to know what strings you use. It's a girl. Oh. Yes. She. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to know what strings you use and how you choose which ones for different guitars. Well, that's easy. I only use one string. You'd think I'd use six, but I just use the one. I know you think I'm using six, but... Sorry. <laughs> I. What I mean to say is I only use one kind of string. I use uh, elixirs. It's all I use. And I only use light gauge. I used to use medium gauge my entire life. I uh, I actually am backwards. I'm like that guy that... Who's that guy that ages backwards? Uh, Benjamin Button. Benjamin Button. Yeah, I'm the Benjamin Button of guitar string using guys. So I started out in this world using heavy gauge Martin strings when I was five. And then when I was... I don't know, 15 or 14 maybe. Yeah, maybe 14 or 13, 14. I, 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 I graduated to mediums and I switched to uh, Dean Markley's became my string choice. And mind you, in these day, in those days, these were the cheapest strings you could buy too because we had no money, horrible, bleh. So watch my life and music show on Mondays. Anyhow, so I had no money. And so we had Dean Markley's. Then I was about 16. I started really getting into bluegrass. And and a guy named Ricky Skaggs. And Ricky Skaggs used to endorse uh, GHS strings. And they and they be, they came out in a phosphor bronze, which, which is a brighter sounding meatier string. So then I switched to GHS phosphor bronze. But they were... Like, I have a serious problem in my pH balance, in my skin. So when I touch a guitar string, it dies, like, in seconds. I, I can, I, I'll tell you how bad it is. If I put any guitar string on, a, on one of these guitars, except for Elixir, if I put anything, I don't care what they are or how expensive they are, it doesn't matter what they are. Martin, GHS, D'Addario... I don't care. Any company, any company, put a regular set of uncoated strings, high-end phosphor bronze strings on a guitar. I can't get through the first set of a show before they're all dead. All of them. That's how acidic my, my hands are. So when I was a kid, I used to boil my strings. This, this is not a joke. I used to, because boiling them would the heat water would would draw the the crap out of the out of the windings that my the, the acid and little pieces of finger that were stuck in there you'd boil them would all come out and they sound brand new again but of course you're you're taking them on putting them on taking them off they break so that's how i used to get around that was boiling the strings and couldn't afford another set so then when i was about 24 25 years old 
this company came called Elixir came around. And by then I was still using medium gauge strings. And they first came out with a polyweb, which was a really unpleasant, uh, crappy rubber coating on the string that made it sound like a crappy rubber string. And uh, I didn't use them anymore. But then they came out with nano web, which is something you can't even see, It's but it's coated. Those strings, for me, I can get six whole shows out of them. And they still sound great, although they might break. But they last six shows. That's 12 sets of music without ever losing a bit of tone. Uh, and then when I was about 28, 29 years old, I had carpal tunnel and surgery on both hands. So I only lasted about another five years after that, after that surgery when I realized that guys like Tommy Emanuel, Chet Atkins, Jerry Reed, all these guys, and even my hero, Bill Elliott, who's actually going to be here Friday night, lockdown uh, uh, release uh, outbreak prison uh, thing, show, you watch it. Uh, he uses light gauge strings, so I switched. And I was amazed at how little difference it made, except my life got way easier. My action got lower, the tone was even better, the guitar got louder, because there wasn't so much pressure on the guitar, and there's no more pressure on my hands, and I was, and you can stretch them more, and you just, you just set your neck a little different so that it doesn't, so they don't rattle, if they rattle at all when you put them on there. And I, and I play bluegrass with light gauge strings on them, and the funny thing is about that is that if you look at a, if you look at a, the old Martins, the, the, and I'm talking about the D28s that everybody wants to use, right? The old Martins. If you look inside, there's a stamp and the heel box is light gauge strings only. But everybody used medium on them. And they wonder why the necks are pulling forward and the bridges are coming off these old guitars. That's why. You're supposed to use light gauge strings. You, you can use mediums. Eh, whatever. It's okay. If you're just playing hard rhythm and you don't care about your action and whatever. But light gauge strings are a godsend for me, and they're all I use, and Elixir is the only brand I use. And uh, there are other coated strings, but Elixirs, they're expensive, but I, I don't care. I love them. So. Who's next? Rob Richardson. Rob Richardson. That You were here last week, too, weren't you? I remember that name. Very possible. I, I'm reading so many comments these days, I'm, I'm seeing everybody's name in my head. Uh, yeah. Uh, he says he's an intermediate Travis finger picker. Feels like he's fat owed. Uh, he's wondering if you can explain your right hand finger style technique. Do you have any tips on how to separate your thumb from your fingers? Uh, <laughs> boy, that's a big question. Not one we're probably going to be answer, able to answer completely on here. But I'm, I'm going to take a note of that because we are starting to add... Uh, new videos to the Master Music Method site. And um, it's a, uh, if you don't know about Master Music Method, you probably see the little, there's a little sticker right in that corner of the screen there. And uh, it's an online, it's an online music service, teaching service. It's only 15 bucks a month. And we're, we're gonna start, we're gonna start putting new material on there. And I'm using this to figure out what lessons to put up next. So that's a good question. Uh, I can answer it partially. Uh, but if you'd like to see it really close up, we do multi-angle shots of the lessons on that site. And I think that would help you. Um, so I'll tell you what I did. When I was a kid, I literally used a tape player to record myself... And I, and I still even remember the tune I did. I, was, I had just gotten uh, a, uh, an album called uh, Me, and, Me and Chet. It was Jerry Reed and Chet Atkins. And they did a tune on there called Nashtownville. It went like this. <laughs>
I love these picks. These are Chet picks. I just got these in the mail today from Amazon's uh, Slick Picks. Uh, so anyhow, what I did with that tune was I literally sat with a tape player and recorded myself doing this. Singing the tune in my head. And I did that a million, million times. And then... I played it back and just did the melody. Oh. See what I'm saying? So what I did was I created, I created two different sets of muscle memory. I recreated this muscle memory, then I created that one, and then if I had a, if I had problems trying to figure, trying to put them together, I would literally f look with my eyeballs and watch and listen and figure out where notes occurred together. So that's how you separate your the two pieces. That's the general idea of it. So there's things happening simultaneously almost 80% of the time through that. And when there's not is when it gets really pretty. When he when he when they do licks like like the there's something going on against the thumb. So those are the two worlds you have to separate. You gotta find the parts that are happening at the same time where there's a strike with one of these fingers that is right on a thumb note and then you have to find the places where the fingers are playing a syncopation against the thumb and believe me it sounds complicated but once you do it if you take something apart that and be precise don't just get the gist of it don't do that put take it apart so you, and use all the right chord forms that you need to play the melody when you're doing all of it at once and take that apart and make sure that thing is just solid. Don't miss anything. And then... Another thing I did was learn how to do this. at the same time and it's exactly what it looks like I figured out what was happening at the same time and I did it in groups of three or four notes at a time until I could until it grew and grew and grew till I could do the whole thing uh, also stuff like another Chet thing the Beatles There's two things going on there. There's a bass line and a melody. So you figure out where they hit together and where they cross against each other. Same thing with Bach. And on and on that goes. That's all the same premise. Bach had, had walking bass lines against melody. And that's all that Chet, Jerry, Tommy, Emmanuel, Merle, Travis, all those, that's what they're doing. And they get a bass line going against a, a converging melody. This never stops. So, if 
you want a closer look at that, I think I'm, I may be tempted to put a lecture up about that because I, I, I was just getting into finger the basics of fingerstyle on the site uh, when we stopped production on the videos. So, yeah, go check that out. And if not, um, there's probably a lot of other places you can discover uh, possibly some good, some well shot videos that show how it works. But that's the, that's the basic premise of the whole thing. Now, before we go any further, I just want to uh, mention again, this is cool. We don't want to forget this. Uh, we've got another gift certificate this week as we were going to have, we're going to have something come every week from G and G music up in Antigonish, uh, Nova Scotia. They're one of the best music stores in the province and uh, he services the whole world online and, uh, and your neighborhood. Where no matter where you're you're going to or coming from, you're passing through Antigonish in this province. And uh, he's got one of the best selections of high-end guitars, Martins, Lakewoods, Boucher, uh, you name it. He And if he doesn't have it, he can get it. So he, uh, this week, our, our buddy up there, Glenn, he's, he's given us a $200 coupon that will go to the winner of our our trivia question tonight. And these questions aren't easy either. I'm not being easy on you guys because, because Google. Google sucks. You can find whatever you want to on Google. So I'm making questions that you can probably Google, but you won't know exactly what to Google. So uh, it'll, it'll take uh, somebody who probably knows the artist I'm going to talk about tonight. And uh, But you never know. But there will be a question near the end of the show. And... After the show, go, go to my Facebook fan page, J.P. Cormier, Facebook fan page on, on, on Facebook, and submit your answer. I'll put a post up that says, put your answer here. And you find that post to put your answer there as a comment. And the first person that goes there that we see that shows up on that feed with the right answer wins $200 coupon against the purchase of any Boucher or Lakewood guitar at G&G at G &G Music in Antigonish. And uh, as I said earlier, Levy Straps is going to be getting involved with us very shortly. They're actually making product for us. So uh, I don't know about this week, but in the coming weeks, you'll also, with all of these giveaways, get a free uh, custom Levy Strap that has G&G &G Music on it. And uh, as soon as we get our logo designed, this is all happening so quickly with the show, uh, the strap will have ours on it as well. So you'll, have a, you'll get a nice leather strap that says G&G &G and ST, String Theory, on it. So it will come with your coupon. So that's kind of cool. That's actually really cool. Um, so let's see. Uh, I just want to make sure my own notes here. If there's anything else I wanted to run over before we go to the next question. Are we quite busy over there? A few more questions, yeah. Okay, cool. Give us another one. Uh, this is from Mr. Joe Cormier. Mr. Joe Cormier, mm -hmm. Brother Joe. Mm -hmm. Don't get funny with me, buddy. <laughs> buddy! <laughs> uh, he wants you to show us an example of bar chords where the index finger doesn't cover all the strings. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, there's any there's any number of things that you, that, that you do that with. Like, like a like a chord like uh, most people here will, will recognize this chord. It's like a it's like a bar A. A lot a lot of the old time guitar players used to play that because it imitated a G chord. So they go up an A. So and play their A that way. Well, there's a cool way to play an A minor that way, which is the bar. <laughs> You're barring four strings here and three, three, three strings here, which makes it an A minor, which is a really cool chord. Tony Rice uses that one a lot. It's the same as this, which is an A minor chord with a three, three string bar on it, which is incidentally also the chord that you play with another bar and so on and so on. It's all played off bar three strings and then four strings. And then I play a lot of position work out of, out of C's. So in G, I'm just moving C up to, up to here. And I, 
I've got that bar down there that gives me which is the same thing as going down in C but if you bar it up here and so on and so on so there's there's a million ways to use bars I use them all the time in different ways. Sometimes I even bar strings in the middle of something with a, with a ring finger, or it's you'll if you if you start to get into guitar at all, you're going to run into those things all the time. Not just in your basic bar chords, your bar E's, A's, and minor chords in, in those formations, but you'll start to run into all kinds of places where you're like, hey, if I bar this, I can go blah, 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 and use your other your other fingers and leave this down as, as a as a nut that's what it is it's a movable nut you're moving the nut up and down the neck by just putting your finger flat on the strings right so yeah what do you, how do you think about that there buddy my brother joe he's always doing that to me he, he called says, me up, thanks, call me up buddy. The, yeah <laughs> he called me up in the middle of the night and go, hey buddy what are you doing all right who's next uh i got a question that's a repeat from uh it's a question from last week that we didn't get to. Um, okay. Uh, the Russell Howe question. Russell Howe. How do you play fiddle style triplets or cuts on the guitar? <laughs> he, says, he has your tab book. Uh, are you playing harder, softer? What's taking? <laughs> uh, you're asking a lot now. I'm not sure if we're going to divulge that to you. I'm only kidding. I. Uh, where's my pick? So, yes, I'm playing much harder. And gripping the pick, pick much harder. It's a it's it's a it's a power move doing a cut on a guitar. You can't do a cut and not tense up. It takes a lot of power to go. I can't even do it because I'm not playing enough. That whole idea of those cuts, they're they're that you get tired from them real quick because they're an explosion of muscle power that has to have a ton of control. You can't fluff through them, and they have to be very quick. And the, the mechanics of them, again, I'm going to do a video for this on Master Music Method as well. Because I've had a million people ask me, and it's so hard to describe this way. There is no way to describe it, really. I can tell you all day. But we need to do some close-up. Uh, I shoot these Master Music videos from the perspective of the player. So you'll be watching my hand from here when you see it. And But that is the case. I'm also... I'm also turning the pick, okay? If I'm playing like so, and I don't play completely perpendicular to the string, I tilt the pick, right? Well, when I do a cut, it tilts even further. I'm playing with the edges of the pick on that type of angle right there, as opposed to straight. I never play straight like this. My pick's always tilted. But when I do the cuts, it tilts even more, because, mostly because... Some of it's because I'm making a fist, almost, and it draws the pickup tighter. And other, also, I'm also turning it consciously to make, the, to make less friction, because the surface decreases. The surface of the pick decreases when you turn it. So that's huge information there for anybody who's ever tried to do that, any kind of Celtic music on the guitar. That's one of the biggest secrets, is turning the pick speeds you up because it decreases the amount of friction because the surface is disappearing. You're not rubbing the whole of one side and the other side on the string. You're just rubbing the edges of the pick on the string. It also fattens your tone when you do that. Like when you, if you play with the whole pick and just drag the whole thing across. Hear how bright and poppy that is? Well, if you turn the pick... It's real fat and real warm and real smooth. And that's how I achieve all of everything I do. All the speed things I do and the tone things and the cuts and the, the triplets when you do clogs. Those 
same, or like the mathematician. <laughs> Those runs are because I'm turning the pick over and getting twice as much speed out of it because I'm barely touching the strings, but I'm getting the fattest, warmest part of the pick. So there you go. That, that right there is worth, I expect you to send me $8 billion for that piece of information. No, I'm only kidding. You don't send me nothing. How about a beer? Send me a beer. I dare you. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Who's next? Uh, Taylor Fortier. Taylor Fortieth, the number. Fortieth. Nice to meet you, Mr. and Mrs. Fortieth. Uh, they're interested in how you should think in terms of key when using a capo for chords and soloing. Should I treat a capo position as uh, same as the uncapo position in terms of note names? No. No. So, but, with that being said, so, if I'm playing in G here, right? Obviously, when I put a capo on the second fret, all the notes in that G scale become A. That's A. So this is now an A, but you're playing a G chord. So, I, obviously, the notes are all going to change, but the best way to do it in your head is to stay in G. Don't think of it as A. You are playing an A, but if your brain is thinking, don't think in A. Think in the key that you're playing in front of the capo. So everything in 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 this key, I'm, my brain's working in G, even though I'm playing an A. I'm, this is a G. This is C, D, G. But it's really A, D, and E. So you don't want to. I guess what I'm saying is, don't transpose on the run. You can do it beforehand when you're trying to figure out what you want to play uh, uh you know you can take it apart before but when you start playing the song or recording the song or whatever don't transpose don't transpose in your head because it takes too much space think if you're wherever you're at it doesn't matter where you are if you're playing up here and you're playing in g your brain just it's g whatever it just wherever whatever key you're playing think in that key but then just also remember that if you need to, uh, you need you'll have to, you may have to refer to someone else that what you're doing is actually in the key of A. And the first note the bass player plays is not a G, it's an A. Because that's actually where you are. So I guess organize it like this. The second fret gives you again why you should learn the circle of fifths. The second fret gives you A, D, and E, right? The third fret gives you B flats and F. The fourth fret will give you Bs out of a G, right? And then the fifth fret gives you a C. Um, so, yeah, it's a... Uh, there's a relationship there that you can memorize, and you don't have to. You can just think of the, out of the key you're playing in. But it helps to understand for people around you who aren't using a capo where you are and you need to be able to tell them that too but for your own brain and your own thought process just think in the key you're playing your left hand's playing in that's that's what i do i i don't i can transpose when i have to and, and call out keys no matter what my left hand's doing because they have perfect pitch but that's nobody you know that's not everybody's ticket right so that's that's how i'd handle that Best of luck to you. Well, thank you for thank you for calling into us. Uh, who's next? Uh, we got Mandarus Maximus. Mandarus Maximus. Uh, uh, they want to know if fifty three is too late to learn. Absolutely not. Listen, I taught a woman in Alabama who was sixty three years old, who had one eye, and it wasn't just. Any eye, it was the left eye. So she was a banjo player who couldn't see the neck of her instrument. She, could, she couldn't see. And well, she, this was her good eye. So she'd have to do this to look at the neck. So she had to learn to play the five-string banjo by feel. What it did was, it didn't matter how old, it doesn't matter how old you are. It just doesn't matter. Unless you've got some physical deformity like, no, she's laughing at me, but it's true. You can't learn to play the guitar if your hands are all crippled with rheumatoid. 
it just isn't going to work. You can maybe play a little bit, but you got to have, you know, if you're still sound in your hands, which most people are, uh, I'm 51, my hands are like I'm a kid. Of course, I've been playing all my life, but still, this woman learned to play the five-string banjo because she could only see her right hand. Her right hand got really good, and her left, on, her left hand was kept up with her, right? But the left hand's not complicated on the banjo, so she learned to play the banjo in, in the space of about, I think, four months, and she was really playing the banjo, like Earl Scruggs. It was amazing, and she couldn't believe it, and I couldn't believe it. And I, it was one of the first times I had ever taught somebody that much. I was a kid then, so I didn't, I wasn't sure. I didn't have any experience with, with, with older people. I had taught children. I taught special needs kids. I, I taught regular adults and people my own age. And she walked in one day with one eye at 63 years old and said, I want to learn to play the banjo. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I can do this. And sure enough, so it doesn't matter. I've seen all kinds of people in their 50s, 60s, learn to play an instrument and play it well in a short amount of time. Uh, I don't know why that is. Could be because you have a bit more time when you're that age, if you're, if you're getting ready to retire or whatever the case may be. It's all about practice, so it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're willing to put the time in, uh, anybody can do anything. So, yeah, I would definitely, if you want to learn to play an instrument, you go for it, because I, I know you can do it, no question. So... There's a follow-up. There's a follow-up. Same person. Okay, cool. Uh, they have an ovation and electric guitar. What's best to start on? The ovation. Always start, if you're a guitar player, always start with acoustic because electric guitars, while they're amazing, and I play electric and always have played electric, it was something I went to later because electric guitars are artificially easy. And they're, they're also harder to deal with because the neck is so long. You have 16 frets clear sometimes. And the action is, is deceiving. It's way lighter than a, guitar, a regular guitar is. So you want to learn on acoustic. And plus you have to plug an electric in and blah, blah. It makes it, it's an extra step you need to do in order to practice. And I hate it. I don't like teaching people on electric. Get an acoustic that's your friend and your buddy and you pick that ovation up and you and you and you tinker on that and that's what you start with it adds miles of strength to your left hand and and teaches you strength in this hand as well because you don't need strength to play an electric because you have a volume button an acoustic guitar you have to hit it a certain way create a certain tone all those tools go over to electric later which will make you a better when you play the electric you'll sound fantastic because you have all this acoustic technique. So absolutely start with the ovation. And we've got time for about one more question. And I can't thank you enough. This is awesome that you guys have come. How many people did we have on tonight? Did you check to see who was the? Uh... Uh, around 70 was the peak. Well, that's so we're up 20 or 30 people in one week. That's fantastic. So I thank you very much and our our sponsors, G&G &G Music, Boucher Guitar, and Levy Straps. Again, if you want to donate to us, if you if you learned something tonight you thought was valuable and you're having a good time, shoot us a couple bucks, paypal.me slash jpcormier music, or e-transfer at jpcormier38, uh, sorry, jpcormier38 at gmail.com. And so now, the Wait. trivia question. One more question. Okay, I guess we have to take one more question. It's a fiddle question, so something different. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is this? It's from Darcy Good. Darcy, I, I know Darcy Good. Uh, sure. Okay, go ahead. What do you uh, got, Darcy? Self-taught uh, bluegrass fiddler, huge fan of Kenny Baker style, and I was wondering if you could give me some advice on cleaning up those double stops. Ta oh, I no, <laughs> I can't. I. I, I'm a terrible double stopper. I, I, it's a, it's an art form and, uh, you have, it's, it's all practice. I've obviously used, I obviously use them and I've played, you know, lots of tunes that have double stop involved with it. But the way that Kenny Baker used double stops was like, he was playing two fiddles at the same time. Like he, <coughs> he could move through 
whole licks that were in harmony. And I, it was, it's a place I never bothered going. I don't know why. I, I dabbled in it, like I say. I have absolutely used double stops immensely through my, throughout my career. But that the level of Kenny Baker, no. The only thing I can tell you is to, is to listen to Kenny Baker. Kenny Baker, and then after Kenny Baker, listen to early Mark O'Connor. He was one of the greatest double stop players ever. And then guys like Johnny Gimble, Howdy Forrester, the old crew. Those guys invented it. Uh, you can listen to lots of people that, that play just like those guys that are around today. But what? why? Go listen to the original guys. And uh, I think the only advice I give you is, is practice. Practice it, practice it, practice it. And practice with double stops that you're familiar with, that you know well. Like the, the, like the basic ones that are, that are on the fiddle. Like uh, just the basic ones in the first position. Fool with those, right? Those kind of things. Work those things until you get comfortable and then start doing the ones that are further apart where the notes are further apart and you're having to make those weird chords with your middle and pinky finger or up the neck with the first and third finger. Like those ones there, they're tricky, tricky, wicky. And I, and I used to use them. I played tunes like Twinkle Twinkle and uh, Comanche and um, Andy's tune. Oh God, Andy's tune is so good. It's Kenny Baker's tune is full of double stops. And I could, I played all those. But it's just, it, I never went crazy and like delved into it 100% because it's, it's, a, it's a whole other career, like being able to do that well. But it definitely makes you a better rounded fiddler if you're playing a bluegrass. And, and another thing, that was the other thing, I never played exclusively in bluegrass. So that's another reason I didn't slide that far down that road because it was too busy, you know, perfecting Celtic and old time music and my Appalachian style and Tommy Gerald stuff and like all the, all those, all the Canadian fiddlers. So yeah, but it's something I would learn if I was you, I would pursue it. Uh, but like I say, clean up on the smallest ones first, the ones that you're right under your hand in the key of G D C F and then start working on the ones that cause you to stretch more that involve the middle, the middle and pinky. Those ones that are in F A D you know the ones. You you know the ones I mean. If you're listening to Kenny Baker, you hear them and go, "Oh, that's awesome!" And you got to watch his fingerings. If you can see him online somewhere, and see how he actually played them with the left hand, that will immensely clean up your own playing. So that's it for tonight. And I just I want to thank you guys so much. This is so much fun. I love this, and. Uh, for all, all my people out there that are already Master Music Method uh, subscribers, uh, we're, we're working on material right now. We're, having, we're still deciding when and what to do, and we're taking a lot of the information from here. But look very soon for, for new material. There'll be all kinds of notifications from your, through your email. And I encourage you to come here and ask me questions here if you're watching this. And uh, just keep an eye open as we put posting on Facebook, here and YouTube, everywhere, when we decide uh, when the next uh, video, the next uh, lecture will go up, which could be tomorrow. Okay. Anyhow, so we thank you very much. My name is J.P. Cormier, and uh, you've been watching String Theory. And remember, music is only as hard as you make it. Don't forget about the question. Oh, the question. The question. I see, interrupted you. I you interrupted know. me. I was right in the middle. See what, see what happens? <laughs> the question for a $200 gift certificate. I faked you out there. Probably 40 people clicked off when I started doing that. They're going to miss this. All the better for you guys that are left. The question is this. It's a hard one. From 1975 to 1999, which marked the end of Chet Atkins' career, he had a rhythm guitar player in his band that recorded with him, played live with him, played television with him, everything. 
from 1975 to 1999. And he also was one of the best guitar players around. He played just like Chet because he learned from Chet. And after Chet's death and after this man's death I'm asking about, he was awarded the CGP by Chet's daughter and the Chet Atkins estate, certified guitar player, and he was the last one ever allowed to carry that certification. They gave it to him posthumously. He worked with Chet from 1975 to 1999. Fantastic guitar player. If you've ever seen Chet live or listened to any of Chet albums and, and, li and read the liner notes, you know this man's name, and that's the question. Who was Chet Atkins' full-time rhythm player from 1979 to 1999? Uh, the first person with the right answer it, on the on my J.P. Cormier fan page, I'm going to put a post up there as soon as we're done. It'll say, what's your answer for tonight's trivia question? Put your answer there in the comments on that post. And the first person to get the right answer gets $200 coupon for any Boucher or Lakewood guitar at G&G &G Music. Good until the 30th of this month. So there you go. I hope that's okay. Who was Chet's rhythm player? 75 to 99. Need his name. On Facebook. On Facebook. Shoot me the answer on Facebook. And we'll be watching for it. And we'll be watching for you to come back here next week, 7 p.m. Wednesday, for more String Theory. And as I said earlier, before I was rudely interrupted by myself, by forgetting to do the most important thing of the show, which was to give the goddamn prize away, is music's only as hard as you make it. We'll see you next time. Thanks a million. <laughs>